Leon Lett was a Dallas Cowboys defensive tackle. He won three Super Bowls with them. Twice Leon went to the Pro Bowl. Yet among football fans, his name is associated not with his successes, but with his disappointments. What you might call major league disappointments, plural. ESPN rated two of Leon Lett's plays in the top three of their top 25 sports bloopers of all time. You understand that? He didn't just make the top 25. He's twice in the top three of the worst sports bloopers ever. Disappointment number one came in Super Bowl um, 27 in January of 1993 against the Buffalo Bills. He recovered a fumble and he was all set to rumble into the end zone when Buffalo Bills player Don Beebe came racing up from behind, slapped the ball out of his hand just microseconds before he broke the touchdown line. The ball bounced out of the end zone, resulting in a touchback that cost Leon his touchdown and glory and his moment of fame. Instead, he just ran into the end zone and kept on running right into the history books of NFL with infamy, with shame, with failure. No one remembers that he sacked the Bills quarterback and caused two fumbles, one of which led to a Dallas touchdown. His mistake didn't cost Dallas the game, but it cost them the record for the most points ever scored by a team in the Super Bowl. Ten months later, in the Thanksgiving game of November 93, there was a rare snowstorm in Dallas. Leon did it again. Only this time, his mistake did cost his team the game. The Cowboys were leading the Miami Dolphins 14 to 13, 15 seconds left on the clock. The Dolphins attempted a 41-yard field goal. If they made it, the game would be theirs. If they missed it, Dallas would retain the lead and gain the victory. What do you think happened? Take a look. Miami's trying to go in and kick a field goal with less than 15 seconds, I believe, left in the game. And if they make it, game's over. If they miss it, we win. Need some sound, guys. We blocked the field goal. It's a 41-yarder. It's a first down kick. And it's blocked. It's blocked and rolling around at the 10-yard line. You can see the ball spinning around on oh, the yeah, white snow. Now not touch the ball. And everybody's saying, get away, Peter, 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 meaning stay away from the ball, stay away from the ball. And all of a sudden, you see one white jersey with a star on it come running out of nowhere. covers the ball at the one-yard line so they get another shot. This time, field goal good, we lose the game. After that game, I felt so bad for Leon, and uh, we couldn't find Leon. Where was he? And he's probably going to go kill himself. I was looking for Leon. Leon was back in the training room, and big old 275, 280-pounder. You know, and tears in his eyes, and he's afraid he's going to get cut. And you know, I grabbed him there in the, in the training room. I said, Leon, I said, hey, yeah, you made a mistake, but there were all kinds of mistakes in that game. And you know, you don't worry about it because as long as I'm here, you're going to be a Dallas Cowboy. Leon was really upset about it, and I never forget a girl from uh, one of the schools had sent him a note and said, Gosh, Leon, don't worry about it. Last year during the Super Bowl. There was this guy that was going in to score a touchdown and, and had the ball ripped out of his hands right before he scored. Oh, oh, it's not, not going to be a touchdown. It's not. So don't worry about it. People make mistakes all the time. It happened to be the same guy. <laughs> it was going to be a 62-yard touchdown return. By People make mistakes all the time. It just happened to be the same guy. I love that video. I can watch that over and over and over again. 
We're in a message series called Bit Players, and what we're looking at are individuals from the scripture that don't have big names that most people remember, like Moses and Abraham and Paul and, and, and things like that, but the little people, yet they played a substantial role in the story of what God was doing in human history. And last week we looked at this guy named Ananias, and his job was to go tell Saul of Tarsus uh, that God had claimed his life and he was now going to become an apostle and actually suffer for Jesus and he needed to be baptized and change his life. And, and uh, the message of that was, you want me to do what? And so we talked about that bit player and uh, some things that God might ask you to do sometimes that would be surprising. This morning we're going to look at a much more significant disappointment, uh, a much more significant bit player in the New Testament than Leon Lett for sure. Uh, the Apostle Paul, just to set this up, has returned from his first missionary journey. The Jerusalem Council has taken place in Acts chapter 15, and in a nutshell, what that said was that the gospel of Christianity was not going to be just a Jewish thing. You don't have to become a Jew to become a follower of Jesus, and that was established at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. Gentiles or non-Jews could find favor with God. They didn't have to obey the Jewish law. And we're very grateful for that today because we're all Gentiles for the most part here. Paul decides he's going to go out and do another missionary journey. This is missionary journey number two and visit the churches that he established on missionary journey number one. So we read in Acts chapter 15 beginning at verse 36. Sometime later Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him, but Paul didn't think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So he started out on the first missionary journey and after a couple cities he bailed out for whatever reason. We're going to explore that in just a moment. And now it's time to go back and do another missionary journey and Paul says, we're not taking this guy. I can't depend on him. He disappointed me. So exactly who is this John Mark guy? Apparently he had a great heritage of faith. I love the little cartoon there. Uh, <laughs> You know who we should totally bring with us? John, who's called Mark. Ooh, no way. I hate that guy. Now, I don't think Paul really necessarily hated him, but there was obviously a strong emotional opinion about not doing any ministry with him ever again. Um, John Mark had a tremendous heritage of faith. His associations uh, were very, very impressive. Uh, the early church, we know, met at the house of his mother Mary, uh, which would have been kind of risky because the early church was uh, being persecuted. That's the house where the believers were gathered in Acts chapter 12 when Peter was in prison for preaching Christ. And remember, he escapes miraculously, comes knocking on the door, and the uh, servant goes to answer it and doesn't even recognize that it's Peter. Apparently, this, this woman had a substantial amount of money because she had a big house and she had servants to provide security. Uh, which means that, that John Mark was hanging out with the apostles. Those are some pretty good associations to have in your, in your resume. His cousin was Barnabas. We know that from Colossians chapter 4. Barnabas was a hugely respected leader in the early church. His generosity had led him to sell his real estate holdings and use that money to help the poor in his congregation. Uh, back in Acts chapter 4. Barnabas had a reputation for discernment and encouragement, which we're going to look at a little bit more in a moment. I mean, he was the one that uh, recommended the Apostle Paul to the church. John Mark's temperament appears to be quite conducive to ministry work, to missionary work. Unsurprisingly, he appears to have inherited some traits from his mom and his uncle. He's willing to go on the first missionary journey. It's going somewhere. They have no idea really what they're doing or what's waiting for them, but he's willing to go. He's willing to take a risk. Uh, he's got a servant's heart. So th this, this is a good guy. You want him with you on a missionary journey. And perhaps most important, his first-hand knowledge of Jesus. Most scholars agree that John Mark wrote the earliest gospel that bears his name. Flip in your Bibles if you have one. 
Gospel of Mark. That was written by this guy. Matter of fact, the other Gospels quote all but 31 verses from the Gospel of Mark. The Apostle Peter would later uh, refer to him as my son. It's believed that he was actually the Apostle Peter's right-hand man, writing down all of Peter's sermons, his messages, his recollections, and that that material became the Gospel that still bears his name. It's also believed that John Mark was the young man who uh, fled at the, at the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested. We're told that one guy's clothes was ripped off and he ran away. A lot of people believe that may have been John Mark. So he knew Jesus. He knew the apostles. He was right in the thick of, of the ministry of, of Jesus and the early church. This guy's got a spiritual pedigree, bar none, in service to the kingdom of God. So what went wrong? Why all of a sudden is he unacceptable for further missionary work right alongside the Apostle Paul? There's nothing at all given in the text to indicate what may have happened, so all we can do is speculate. Was he homesick? Did he get sick? I went to Haiti earlier in the year and got bit by a spider, and it turned out rather ugly. I understand that things can happen on the mission field, and... I didn't have to go home, but I I, I endured through it. Did he have some emergency at home? We have our own missionaries here on PEI. Lynn Rayner, a couple years ago, was in Mali with her husband, and her mom died. Had to leave. Completely understandable. Was there a personality conflict? Did you know that there are some personalities that are hard to get along with? Can I inform you of that this morning? That, That might, and that happens in the church. Believe it or not, there are some personalities between people who are committed to Jesus and the expansion of his kingdom, but when they try to work together, it's like oil and water. Have you ever noticed that? Newsflash. There it is in the New Testament. So it could have been a personality thing that happened here uh, on this trip, which is a possibility. And I've seen that on the mission field, and it's uncomfortable, and you have to work through it. More than likely, my guess is, and it's just a guess, my guess is he wasn't happy with a change of leadership. Not going to read all the verses, but if you you take a look through the book of Acts chapter 13, twice we read Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul. And in scripture, generally the first person named carries a little bit more weight. So Barnabas is apparently kind of taking the lead on this first missionary journey, at least in the beginning. Then they have a conflict with this sorcerer that Paul just tears into and uh, and takes the lead on that. And then after that conflict, verse 13, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Had Paul decided to take charge? Had Barnabas agreed to step back? There doesn't appear to be a problem between Barnabas and Paul, but something happened there. My guess is that uh, the change in leadership may have been what uh, John Mark just couldn't take for whatever reason. Maybe there was some immaturity there that he's not real old. Did you know that there are immature people in the church, in your life? Did you know that I was immature once? Hard to believe. Uh, I've got kids now in their 30s, and it's just delightful for my wife and I to uh, look back, and we, we just see things through such a different prism. It's like, I, I can see what they're doing now, because I was that way once, and my gosh, I was so stupid. But I outgrew that. That's, the, that's, that's, that's a good place to put an amen. So what's John Mark going to do now? He doesn't have a missionary. Well, actually, he, he, he goes on with, with, his, with his cousin. And, and it's kind of cool. I mean, the conflict that happens here results in more ministry being done. So that's a good thing. Not all conflict is terrible. Sometimes God will use conflict to accomplish his will. He's God. He's sovereign. We get that. But we're not told anything else about John Mark's life. The, bio, the Bible is silent about his next couple of years. Um, 
Did he assume leadership roles somewhere else? Did he kind of take the back seat? Did anyone reach out to him? Um, eventually, he started hanging out with Peter. Is, is that where he began to write what would become known the Gospel of Mark? Um, the cool thing is you fast forward about 20 years. John Mark has just, he's a footnote. And Paul is in, in prison writing one of his last letters. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Get Mark. Because he's helpful in my ministry. He's profitable. 20 years has gone by. And something has changed in, in Paul's mind towards John Mark. Wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on the wall in that conversation? Apparently, they have talked in the inter intervening years. Wouldn't you love to know the story? When did Paul come to the conclusion that maybe he had come to the wrong conclusion about John Mark? When, when did Paul realize that this guy was salvageable? Did he read about him in a missionary newsletter? Did he hear about it through the grapevine? Did he hear him speak at a missions convention? Did he bump into him, some of his converts along the way? Did he read about it on Facebook? We, we don't know. But somehow they, they have a reconciliation. Did John Mark years later grow up a little bit and bump into the Apostle Paul and say, I'm sorry, you know what happened back there in Pamphylia when I bailed out on you guys? I realize now I was a dweeb. I, I was totally out of line. And when you wouldn't let me go with you that second time, man, that really, that forced me to do some thinking. Sometimes we have to face the consequences of our behavior to get into line. Thing is, we just don't know. And, and did the Apostle Paul say, hey, you know, I was really hard on you. I'm sorry. I realize now that I, I, I should have given you a chance. And, uh, would you, have you ever had those kind of conversations where you reconcile? There's been hard feelings. There's been misunderstandings. And you finally, someone, someone, usually it's great when you both, but someone throws up the white flag and says, let's talk. I don't like where we are. There's an elephant in the room and no one's addressing it. That happened at some point between these two guys. We just don't have the details. So what's that got to do? 2,000 years ago, this no-name guy gets ejected from a missionary trip. What has that got to do with you today in 2016 on Prince Edward Island or wherever you are in the world? Well, here's some suggestions. I think some of you sitting out there and listening right now might be John Mark. I don't know what you've got going on in your life. I don't know what disappointment you're carrying. I don't know who you've disappointed. I don't know how you've disappointed them. It might even be yourself. It could be your parents. It could be a teacher. It could be a friend. It, you name it. But some of you are John Mark. Go ahead and raise your hand if you're John Mark this morning. Just put it up there high. <laughs> Just call me Leon Lett. Somewhere in your life you slid into the football and knocked it into the end zone. Maybe everybody knows it. Maybe nobody knows it. Is there someone that you need to go to and apologize for something? Swallow the pride. Admit it. One of the hardest statements to make, isn't it? I was wrong. I'm sorry. And then let it go. Don't insist on being reinstated. The word disappoint comes from Middle English. It means to remove from office. You appoint to office, you disappoint, you unremove from office. When you disappoint somebody, you, you may have to go through a period of not being able to do what you want to do or feel called to do right away. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Ted Haggard. He was a couple years ago president of the National Evangelical Association, had a big church in Colorado, 15, 20,000 people, got caught up in a drug abuse and homosexual scandal. Lost it all. Anyone, from, anyone ever hear of Ted Haggard? Not too many. went through a very long period of time before he was allowed to go back into ministry. And there's still some people say he shouldn't be in ministry. 
I, I did a men's conference here a couple years ago at Cornwall Christian Church, I don't know, six or seven years ago, and I had one elder stand up and say, that man never repented. He should never be back in the pulpit. I'm like, how do you know what someone else has done in their heart with God? But I get that. Some of you are John Mark. You may disappoint someone and you may never be forgiven by them or accepted by them and they may hold your disappointment up in your face at every opportunity. That's part of living with the consequences of what you did. I think of Perry Noble. Is anyone familiar with Perry Noble? Pastor of one of the largest churches down in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and just like two or three weeks ago was fired by his church because of an alcohol problem. 30,000 people attend his multi-site churches. He's had a huge influence. When Perry Noble speaks, a lot of people listen. Donald Trump would love to be friends with Perry Noble. Perry is now in treatment. And I was never a huge fan of Perry Noble, personality conflict. I think if I were to hang around with him, one of us would kill the other. I just, I, just, I can't. And some of you feel that way about me. I get it. But I appreciate that Perry Noble put out a video, and, and you know what he said? He said, I blew it. I should have gone to Jesus with my problems. Instead, I went to the bottle. And he said, and some of you say that you love me so much, and you're angry at the church for firing me, and you're not going to go to the church, and you're going to show the church. And he says, if you love me, would you return to the church? I thought, he just went way up in my eyes. That's a class move right there. He's not asking to be reinstated. He may or may not ever step behind a pulpit again, but he's, he's disappointed himself. He's disappointed his church. He's disappointed everyone that ever looked up to him. But now he's going to go and learn some things about himself, and he's going to learn some things about the grace of God, and whether or not he gets back into a ministry, I have the sense he's, I think he will, but I have the sense that he's willing to let God decide when that time will be. If it is to come, that list could go on and on. I think of Gordon McDonald. One of my favorite guys, years and years ago, decades ago, Gordon McDonald wrote a best-selling book called Ordering Your Private World. It was a bestseller, and it was just tremendous wisdom and advice on how to set up your private world so that you can be the best person God made you to be and have the greatest impact for his kingdom and with your family and with your job. It was just everyone loved Gordon McDonald. And then the news came out that he had made some very poor choices and had chosen some, some relationships that had no business in his life, and he lost it all. Several years went by, nobody heard from Gordon McDonald. He accepted the discipline and the consequences of what his disappointment had cost. Eventually came back. His marriage was saved. And now he's back in ministry in the kingdom of God. But he wrote another book. He's actually written several, but he wrote another book after that. And it was called Rebuilding Your Broken World. I throw Gordon McDonald out there because some of you know what I'm talking about. You might be living it right now. If you're wrestling with disappointment, I highly recommend get a hold of Gordon McDonald's book, Rebuilding Your Broken World. Because it's written by a guy who was there. And he's come back. And he can help you go through the very painful process of coming back. So some of you are John Mark, but some of you are the Apostle Paul. Some of you have very high standards, and you set high standards for yourself, and you set high standards for everybody around you, especially if you're in a management position. You've got people responsible to you. You know you've got to set the bar high, and you expect them to meet that. Some of you are the Apostle Paul, because that's what he was. He was a type A personality. He was driven. He couldn't sit still. His mind was always racing with what the next opportunity was going to be for the kingdom of God. And so maybe you're him, and someone that you highly regarded and trusted, they let you down. Is there someone in your life right now that maybe you need to rethink their potential? You've written them off. Maybe it's a family member. 
Maybe it's an employment situation. Maybe it's a friend. Is it possible that you missed something? Is it possible that you acted a bit too hastily? Is it possible that there's a real help meet, that there's a, a real fellow servant there that you're missing for whatever reason, and maybe they need another chance? So maybe you're John Mark and you've blown it. Maybe you're the Apostle Paul and someone has completely disappointed you. Or maybe some of you are Barnabas, and I know that some of you are. Don't you love the Barnabases in your life? I would not be in ministry if it weren't for Barnabas. Several of them. You're a, you're a listener. You're an astute observer. You see beyond the deed to the need. You have an understanding of the psycho stuff that's happening behind the scenes. And you just don't react to what someone does, but you ask the question, well, why are they doing that? And what caused them to do that? And I wonder what happened in their seedbed, as my wife and I call it now. And you don't just react to the disappointments that come at you, but you try to understand what maybe drove those disappointments. You've got some empathy with people. You see their potential. My wife is the best Barnabas I could ever have. Because I have done some dumb, dumb, dumb stuff. Believe it or not. And she chooses, and she will tell you this, she chooses to see the good and to see the potential. And she has been asked point blank, why are you still with him? And she's like, well, he's the best guy in the world. She has discernment. She's done that with our daughters. You know the story, or some of you know the story, but my dad, he died this spring, but we had been estranged for 10 years. That was at his bidding, didn't want anything to do with me. And I have, I have that trait. I can cut people off, and it's scary. And so now i got grown daughters, and things happen in their lives, and the only way I know how to react is from what I was taught with, what I was raised with, what's in my genetics, and so I just want to go, boom, I'm done with you. I'm, I'm the Apostle Paul that way. And there's my wife being Barnabas. No, no, no. You never cut family off. And so my daughters appreciate her Barnabasness, which is a new word we just invented. Keep on encouraging if you're a Barnabas. And if you need a Barnabas or if you have a Barnabas, let them know how much they mean to you today. Those of us who are John Marks, we love you. And you Apostle Paul types, you need them as well. You need, if you're an Apostle Paul type, you need someone to stand in the gap between the disappointee and the disappointed. And so, if you're a Barnabas, is there anyone that God has laid on your radar right now that might need some encouragement? Pray about it. Are there any Apostle Pauls, if you're a Barnabas, that you need to go up to and say, hey, why don't you give them another shot? Because a lot of times these people are married to each other. You have a Paul and you have a Barnabas. Andy Andrews wrote a book a couple of years ago told, called The Traveler's Gift. He wrote this. He said, most people fail at whatever they attempt because of an undecided heart. Should I or should I not? Should I go forward or should I go back? He says, the undecided heart searches for an escape. A committed heart does not wait for conditions to be exactly right. Conditions are never exactly right. To wait, to wonder, to doubt, to be indecisive is to disobey God. He said, I must have a decided heart. Somewhere in the intervening 20 years between John Mark's bailing out on Paul and Paul's request that he come to him, Mark developed a decided heart. So whoever you've disappointed, who, whoever's disappointed you, a heart that's decided for God is always going to win. What has your heart decided this morning?
Can we say one last word about Leon Lett? In 2009, after he uh, retired from football, he graduated from the University of Las Vegas with a degree in history and sociology. And do you know that since 2011, he's a defensive coach with the Dallas Cowboys. Still there. A couple months, you'll see him on the sidelines. He's back in the game. He never stopped learning. He didn't allow his past mistakes and disappointments to keep him from moving on with his life. God's goals are not dependent on our getting everything right. My friends, if you have disappointment in your life that you're carrying regret and guilt for, let me just encourage you, guard your heart, keep trying. After you've messed up, you can be used by God. You know, it's appropriate that John Mark wrote the gospel that bears his name because his story, when you think about it, is the gospel, isn't it? What is the gospel? We have lots of people watch and listen online. We have guests all the time. Here's the gospel. It doesn't matter where your feet have been. It only matters where they're headed now. I love that. God doesn't hold your past against you. Some people do. We live on Prince Edward Island. I can't say this for sure, but I understand some people that live here and were born here have long memories. I don't know if that's true or not. But I hear that it's possible that that's the case. That is not the case with God. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our sins from his presence. Jesus has never had a perfect person to work with. We're all broken. We've all disappointed other people. We've all disappointed God. We've all disappointed ourselves, if we're really, really honest. It's just a matter of degree. It's just a matter of kind. It's a matter of whether we're willing to admit it or not. Because if you're willing to admit where you've blown it, if you're willing to accept the forgiveness that God has for you, if you're willing to move ahead, then you too can have a very different kind of future, a very significant future, a very satisfying future. You too can be helpful to whatever God is doing in this world, just like John Mark. And that's the gospel. Someone say amen. Amen. Worship team.